Hello everyone, Perry and Dennis here in what might look like our usual Burbank studio, but right now in reality, we are actually in Las Vegas for Comic-Con. Yes. Do you think you're having fun at this moment? I'm having a blast. <laughs> I, I, I can see myself in the future, which is also now, and we're all having a blast either at one of the panels that we are hosting or the booth that we have at Las Vegas Comic Con. If we're talking about the exact moment in time this video goes up, I am likely schwitzing from nerves over having to host the Jason David Frank panel, which I am very excited the Power about. Round, Power Rangers my, 25th, right? Mighty nervous. Yeah, and also, like, of all people, it's the Green Ranger. Green Ranger. I loved him. Loved him. I still love him. He's so cool. So hopefully I think that went well today. Uh, but we have five mailbag questions to get to. As always, I have to remind you guys, mailbag isn't only on the YouTube channel. You can catch it in podcast form as well under the movie talk feed so go check that out and tell people you know about that please also if you want one of your questions read here on the show four places to send it it's mailbag at collider.com on twitter facebook or instagram those weren't the right numbers that i was counting with my <laughs> hands but you know it's fine vegas question number one today is an email from michael who writes hi collider i was just listening to the two marks on the special star wars podcast and they were talking about kathleen kennedy and george lucas as producers and how kathleen was not a creative producer that got me wondering what is the role of a producer and what is the difference between an executive producer and a producer keep up the great work and thank you for taking my question yeah if people don't know what he's talking about uh mark fernandez who's the CEO and owner of Collider, him and Mark Riley did a special podcast about that. Um, this is actually one of the toughest questions to answer, mm -hmm. and we've gotten variations of it uh, because the pro a producer does it varies so much on what a producer does. It could literally mean nothing, yeah, or everything. Like the producer could be like the most important person and they could be like the least important. Like I remember, remember that Gone in 60 Seconds uh, remake, the one with I think Nicolas Cage and oh, yeah, Angelina, yeah. Angelina Jolie. Uh, I believe the wife of the original director slash creator of that series, she got like an exec producer credit on it. I don't think she did anything on you know what i mean sometimes it's literally like you introducing someone to someone yeah, or you yeah. maybe owning a certain property like look we all love stanley right he gets a lot like these like exec produced credits and whatever credits and whatnot he does nothing on these on, on those marvel movies he, he created a lot of these characters and you know he has influence in, in that regard but when they actually make the movie nobody's calling stanley and going hey you know we got this one thing uh do you think we should go this way or that none of that's happening but that is what he did though which is why he earned the credit yeah but but what i'm saying is like <laughs> yeah yeah you, like physically do anything on the actual production yes yeah uh yeah i mean that's that's a very accurate thing a producer can have many different definitions which which is why it's a difficult question to answer because it's not one specific definition that has to be met from production to production it could change in terms of creative producer I can, the only experience I could speak from with that is that's why I chose the film school I went to is because the producing program, they specifically referred to it as creative mm -hmm. producing. And I would have to admit that while I was, dur during that program, what I was learning was essentially how to be a producer from a creative standpoint, mm -hmm. supporting the vision and, and helping with the script and, and anything to make the story more powerful. Whereas I think where my program lacked was in skills like, uh, like line producing yeah. or, or even, or even a uh, film law, that kind of stuff I missed out on. So I consider myself a creative producer, and whenever I'm producing something, I do tend to go out and try to find some sort of person with line producing expertise because that kind of balances out what I think I'm capable of as a creative producer. 
looking at executive producer or a producer credit, I can give you an example of uh, the movie that I made. I had a producing credit and so did my producing partner mm -hmm. on that. We were the boots on the ground. We had hands on with everything. Mm -hmm. We were responsible for the day to day of pre-production, production and post-production. Our executive producers, many of them were people who contributed to the budget of the movie. Yeah. There, there were a lot of the people that supported us financially. So that can really mean anything and especially, you know, Let's let's take into account when you have an actor with a really big name, maybe that actor hooked up the producer and the director with some of their actor friends and that's what filled their ensemble. Maybe they get an executive producing credit. It can mean so many different yeah, things. Yeah, you could you could literally hand money over to a uh, production and then get exec yeah. pro producer credit. There's a lot of different things. Or even if it's not money, you could be the guy who introduces the production to whatever distribution or studio that mm -hmm. they need to do. So it's, it's so many things that, that their producer can or could do, but it doesn't mean all of them. Um, just for uh, references, I actually used to do the Producer Guild Awards, or not awards, sorry, conference mm -hmm. every year. I used to cover, like I was in charge of uh, coordinating the kind of the filming crew for, for all of it. And one of the things that they had come up with, and it's still going on right now, is the producer's mark, which is kind of like a way to tell people this person really actually, you know, I don't know if they're still doing it now, but I know for a while they were, they were pushing it. So, like, they would verify that you were actually doing they, You couldn't get a producer's mark if you just, like, signed, like, a check or something like that, or okay. you, or you okay. owned a certain property. They had they gave a producer's mark so that it was like verification that you actually worked on it in a, in a, in a much larger capacity. Interesting. Yeah. And even after all this, we never even touched touched on uh, co-producers or associate producers yeah. or whatever other variation of producer there is out there. Yeah. So yeah, when they're talking about Kathleen, they're, they're talking that she probably was a behind the scenes in terms of the business. She probably got her hands, you know, really dirty in that aspect of like, hey let's concentrate on this because we need to align our property or product when you were talking about star wars uh because we have this coming out or that mm -hmm. coming out or let's make a deal with these people so i think that's kind of uh what they were driving at yeah want to move on to number two yeah uh second one we have from email cam he writes hey collider speculative <laughs> question about avengers 4 i've seen and heard a lot of theories about how the dusting is possibly reversed one of the common theories is time travel if time travel is the path taken it goes to reason that the characters who are dusted will have no memory of the event my question is would you like to see the characters who return from the dusting have some kind of memory of what happened and then have to deal with the emotional toll going forward in future movies Thanks for answering my questions. I think I've been thinking about live or die so much that this never even mm -hmm. crossed my mind. And ever since I read this question, I can't stop thinking about it. So if it is time travel, that has to mean if you're playing by cinematic time travel rules that they're not going to remember what happened. And mm -hmm. if they don't remember what happened, that takes away from so much of Infinity War. I think I want them to. I want them to remember. I think I want them to remember because I remember and I know, and I want to see them process everything after whatever Avengers Four does to fix it. But I don't know. I've I've been kind of obsessing mm -hmm. over this and thinking myself in circles. I would be surprised if we were in a position where all those main heroes we lost came back and had absolutely no recollection of what mm -hmm. Thanos had done. That's it just, you know, I can't really give you a specific reason why it just seems less likely to me that that would be the case. Cause you know, you, you want them to process the events of Avengers four. Yes. That, that's why like I, I I'm against this whole, like everybody come back and Kumbaya type of stuff because they're, they're, a lot of people are talking about the, the time travel thing and saying like, oh, okay, well, if they use time travel, that means Thanos never gets the gauntlet and he never does the snap and everything, whatever happens. And, and I feel like they're going to make it so that it's going to have some sort of rules to it where he can't, they can't go back so far. You know what I mean? They're not going to go back to like when Thanos was born and you know what I mean? And, and snuff and take him out or something, you know? It's not going to be like that. <laughs> With the dusting, 
that's kind of the first time I've heard that term because I always talk post snap, pre snap type of stuff. Yeah. Um, Man, the more I think about it, the more I think this is going to happen. But it's going to be time travel and they're not going to remember anything. And then that would make a whole lot of sense for kind of, you know, opening the door to a new phase. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're starting with a with a clean slate. Yeah. Um, but if it's not time travel, then another possibility people have speculated is they don't actually die. They go into, you know, the soul gem. Yeah. And then maybe they see Gamora there, and then maybe it gets reversed. They come back out, and maybe they have memories of that. I don't know. That seems less likely to me. I'll issue a, a very brief spoiler alert to mm -hmm. anybody who doesn't want to know anything about some of the uh, the paparazzi-style photos that have been taken of mm -hmm. Avengers 4. But because of those photos, it is making me think that it's more likely that it's time travel mm -hmm. because those photos aren't, some of them, very reminiscent of the Battle of New York. Yeah. Uh <laughs> they've they've taken pictures that look like an alternate reality yeah. version. Yeah. So connecting the dots. Connecting the dots in a way that maybe I don't want them to connect right now because part of me very strongly wants them to all remember what happened because I greatly, as a viewer, value what happened in that movie. But I think that if we have seen anything from Marvel, especially recently, if it's something that we could predict right off the bat, I imagine there's going to be some sort of major twist or reveal or something that we're not expecting. So I'm just going to hold on to that glimmer of hope right there. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, moving on to question number three. It's an Instagram question from Tristan MWC, who writes... You better drink that soda fast. Yeah, that is yeah. a short question. Yeah. Mini trailer, before the trailer, why... Uh, I hate the mini trailers <laughs> before the trailers because it's like, why am I watching a preview of what I'm about to watch? It's like, it's like if you went to go watch a movie in the theater and then you watch the two minute trailer of, mm -hmm. of that movie, right? Instead of watching like different movie trailers, you're watching the one you're actually going to watch. Uh, <coughs> I heard that it's because of YouTube commercials that like because of the whole five second like skip thing, they can take their videos and place them in other YouTube videos as ads. And so they'll see that first mm -hmm. quick five second hits. And then that way, if they choose to, they can continue watching it. I personally hate it because it's like, now you're spoiling. Yeah what I'm about to see. And typically you're spoiling some of the best shots in the trailer too. Yes. So I, I don't like it for that reason, but after having picked this question, I read a lot about it and I'll direct you guys to a great uh, piece that was on Slash Film that really breaks down a whole lot of information and they reached out to a lot of people in the industry to get their thoughts on it. And it, it makes sense. I think it's something like it makes people four times more likely to actually watch it because mm -hmm. because part of their reasoning is that nowadays we're all operating on you know like cell phone mode where you're scrolling like that so if something quickly grabs your attention for three to five seconds you're more likely to stop and look at it but then you know they have quotes from a whole bunch of people who work in the trailer industry creating trailers and it's like a major uh, creative disagreement where you know the the people who work for the trailer houses they are making the trailer that we see the full trailer they are not making those little three to five second pieces so then you have someone else essentially spoiling what could take months and months of work just to get those quick eyeballs so while it does make sense to me in terms of it being an advertising tool to make sure people stop and pay attention that sucks because I also deeply value trailers as an art form yeah and also ruins those moments right like especially like uh, someone who goes to Comic-Con every year, you go to Hall H and they debut a trailer. Mm -hmm. Imagine if they play those five seconds before, you're ruining yeah. some of the coolest shots. The the clap, people will like see a shot of like a character they didn't know was gonna be in the movie. They pop up, they're like clapping and cheering. That's all yeah. gone. You don't have that wow moment, right? Because they're ruining it. Yeah, just so you guys have one of the quotes from that Slash Film article. Um, they talked to uh, Sony Pictures Entertainment's EVP of Worldwide Digital Marketing, and 
He said these three to five second bumpers have helped our mobile optimized trailers increase both retention and interest by almost four times. Then another really interesting thing that was in that Slash Film article is they talked to someone named Monica Brady, who's the director and executive producer of the Golden Trailer Awards, and she was saying that that ultimately it's gonna it's gonna give even more opportunity. So right now, a lot of times when you click on one of these and it's got the three to five seconds, it's a trailer for the same trailer you know what I mean it's advertising the same exact thing they're gonna hit a point where or at least she predicts she says I think they're going to cross advertise it so that's interesting to me where one studio before you sit down to watch that highly anticipated trailer you've been waiting for you get three to five seconds of another movie from that studio that seems a little more legit to me than Mm -hmm. basically spoiling three to five seconds of what you're about to watch It's interesting. Uh, it's fascinating, yeah. Pretty soon we just don't even need to watch the movies. They're just going to... They're going to transmit yeah, things into our brains. And then you've seen it. Yeah. You just, like, they tell you, this is the movie that's coming out. You want to watch it or not? And then... How do you know we're not getting subliminal messaging already? That's, and it's already in our heads. possibly true. <laughs> All right. On to the next question from Twitter. We have at uh, S. Reek Kumar, or S. Reek Kumar 625. He writes... Do you think Mission Impossible, Impossible Fallout will be the highest grossing film in the franchise thus far? I always say it's tough to say this early on. I'm going to wait until I see the movie and I get a sense of the general consensus on how good that is. Because, yeah, brands do attract moviegoers who like that particular brand. But I think when it comes to tipping the scale with certain films the quality of the movie is what's going to draw even more people to it. But just looking at some of the Mission Impossible numbers, I think it might have a chance if mm. we're just talking about opening weekend. So looking at the openings, the, the highest grossing actually was uh, Mission Impossible 2. Actually, I take it back. I don't think, it, <coughs> I don't think it's going to do that. Uh, Mission Impossible 2 opened with um, almost $58 million, And then the next highest one is uh, 2015's Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, which opened with almost $56 million. I think uh, I think this movie might have a little bit of a hard time doing that because the summer is just more stacked than ever. Looking at what Rogue Nation opened against, for example, so Rogue Nation made all that money, almost caught Mission Impossible 2 as the highest opening for a Mission Impossible movie. It was only up against Vacation, that Vacation mm-hmm, remake, mm-hmm. which only made about 15 million. Mm-hmm. That's not a whole lot of competition. Now, when we're looking at uh, we're looking at this movie, so this one has <sighs> this is a lot. So it's got Mamma Mia and the Equalizer coming out the week before, or is it opening up against it? I might have written this wrong. The week before is Mamma Mia and the Equalizer, and then the week before that is Hotel Transylvania and Skyscraper. The only thing opening up against this new Mission Impossible movie is Teen Titans Go. And, you know, to be honest, even as someone who does uh, these box office predictions regularly and obsessively, I don't quite know what to make of that one yet. It's obviously not direct competition, but I think what we might see throughout the entire month of July is enough of a ripple effect that Mission Impossible could wind up being rocked a little, more so Mm. than it might have had it been in Rogue Nation shoes last year. Okay. uh, Three years ago. So for me, Mission Impossible Fallout is one of my most anticipated movies of this year. Uh, I love Rogue Nation. (laughs) I really liked... uh, Ghost Protocol, but Rogue Nation I thought was a better movie. However, it it came close to Ghost Protocol's number, but actually did not uh, beat it. I think Rogue Nation made 195 domestic, 682 worldwide. Ghost Protocol made 209 domestic, 694 worldwide. So it's kind of not like it's like a downward spiral or anything, but I thought the, the, the quality of the movie was even better, yet it didn't make as much money. So I don't think it's going to make the most out of all the Mission Impossible movies, even though I'm really looking forward to it. And it possibly could be the best one, in my yeah. opinion. I just don't think it's going to make that type of money. I don't know. The more I keep looking at these numbers, at least on an opening weekend scale, the more I think it, yeah, I'm like starting, I'm like actually processing this all live on camera, yeah. which I'm sure is really exciting and insightful to all of you, especially to the people who are only listening this on, listening to this on podcast form. But 
I think if the mo the momentum continues to mm -hmm. build, because I'm also thinking about all of the extra promotions something like a Mission Impossible movie gets compared to other action movies because of Tom Cruise and all the crazy stunts. It's like, you know, we always laugh and when when is he going to get too old to do mm -hmm. these stunts? But think about how much we spoke about this particular action movie leading up to its release compared to, I mean, maybe it's maybe something like Skyscraper. You know what I mean? Just because... Like he broke his ankle. He did another yeah. death-defying stunt that was even bigger than the last one. I don't know. I'm on the I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence right now. Opening weekend-wise, though, I'm right around Rogue Nation, Mission Impossible Two numbers. Okay, but overall, though, will it? Cause, will well, it? Because you said Rogue Nation was the second highest see, opening, but it actually made less than Ghost Protocol. I think I become even more heavily reliant on the quality of the movie mm. because. You know, I, I know uh, I know some folks like to brush off cinema score, but mm. cinema score does tend to indicate what the general response is going to be from the general movie going public. And if it's got a really high score, it's likely to hold over more. It's mm. likely to have longer legs. So I think once I see the movie, if that movie is a crowd pleaser, that's when it's going to have the chance to catch these other movies. Mm. But if if crowds don't like it, it could open big just because of the brand and what, then what's, fall what's flat the on date its face. On it? What's the date? Mission Impossible. Yeah. It's the last weekend of July. Okay. So, not that far away now, which yeah. is weird. <laughs> All right. We have one more today. Mm -hmm. That we do. It is an email from Jerry. And Jerry writes... I like talking about the next superhero, Star Wars, <laughs> studio, blockbuster, franchise, reboot, etc. as much as the next Collider fan, but give me a movie that's being worked on that I probably know nothing about, but should keep an eye on. What you got, Dennis? That's interesting. Um, yes, we do cover a lot of Star Wars, comic book movies, franchises, blockbuster stuff here. And, and yeah, we, we want to cover more stuff. I, I think one of the, the hard things is, like for me, for example... I'm really looking forward to The Irishman, Martin Scorsese's yeah. next movie. It's going to be on Netflix. We we haven't heard anything about it. They're not releasing any information. We don't have a trailer. There's no pictures. I mean, other than like the, the kind of, uh, you know, the paparazzi mm -hmm. style pictures. And so it's, it's a lot harder to like talk about these movies that we're just not given a lot of information about. And it's very hard to speculate on them where it's much easier to speculate on franchises because you have what, either source material, previous movies, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's that's a reason why it's a little harder to cover movies that aren't in, in that area. Um, I know one movie that I had no idea was coming out uh, that we all loved the trailer was The the Bad Times at the oh El Royale. Oh my God, I love that trailer, yeah. Uh, Drew Goddard, who, who wrote and directed Cabin in the Woods. Mm -hmm. uh, he's doing that, that looks great. John Hamm, Jeff Bridges, and uh, Chris Hemsworth. Um, yeah, so it's a little harder. Uh, one thing, this led me to actually a television series I didn't even know was happening because I was trying to figure out, oh, what's coming out? So uh, uh, Taylor Sheridan, who wrote uh, Wind River, he directed that. He also wrote uh, Hell or High Water and Sicario. He has a TV show that just started on air on the Paramount Network called Yellowstone, that stars Kevin Cotton. I had no idea this thing was happening. But yeah, that's like something that's kind of like under the radar. Yeah. Um, I wish we could cover more under the radar stuff yeah. too. But yeah, you know, it's also because so much of our coverage is based on whatever is in our face at that mm -hmm. given moment. So even when you bring up something like uh, El Royale, you know, the, the reason we started talking about it is because they released a killer trailer. Yeah. And, and that's what got the conversation going. But the one that is probably not on your radar that I, for one, am keeping a close eye on is the adaptation of the book Bel Canto. So I love reading now, but, you know, I, I like audiobooks even more. But still, sometimes I will read a book. Back when I was in high school, I would find every which way to not do the reading assignment, but still get an A. And somehow I managed to pull it off quite often. But one of the few books that I actually read cover to cover in high school was Bel Canto. It, it's about like a, an opera singer who, who goes to uh, South America to perform somewhere. And what winds up happening is, you know, like someone goes and attacks this, this mm. party and, you know, terrorists come kind of come in and, and basically take over. Um, so 
that book really got me. And then I think for like years and years, they had been talking about maybe we're going to adapt it. Maybe we're going to adapt it. And then can this year came mm -hmm. around and I found a, an article on variety and it was, it was that screen media had acquired the North American rights to the movie. And I was like, I didn't even know that happened. And I think there was something in that report. Yeah, a, a national theatrical release is planned for September. I don't even see it on any calendar anywhere, but but that's one that like I didn't even realize they actually made. I just heard that it was being optioned and I figured it was kind of like in development hell type thing, but apparently that was made. And Julianne Moore stars as the opera singer. And um, and yeah, I kind of, I'm, I'm really pumped to see this if it if it ever comes out. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like with some of these under the radar stuff, it's really just going to be all about word of mouth. I mean, last year, Get Out was a big hit, right? Mm -hmm. It got nominated, ended up winning an uh, Oscar for uh, Best uh, Original Screenplay. It was word of mouth that made that movie big. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, people were like, okay, it's Jordan Peele from Key and Peele coming. They weren't really like, taking it seriously until it came out so yeah. i feel like that's kind of the only way we can hear about these under the radar stuff i mean even good word of mouth is important <laughs> i mean even us like for whether it's like movies or tv shows that aren't like being uh, talked about a lot like how many times have you gone to netflix and be like oh there's an, a new original movie that just came out or there's a new original tv yeah. series that just came out and you had no clue well, that's, I feel like that's also the nature of the rise of streaming services and all the original projects that are being made there. I mean, particularly with Netflix, mm -hmm. it's just, they release so much stuff. I mean, it feels like every other week I'm getting brand new feature films on Netflix that I never even realized existed. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's a thing in, in the long term for them is they should find, uh, <coughs> you know, more prominent ways to promote some of their new stuff. Amazon, none of us had heard about the marvelous Miss Maisel. Like there was no like promotion. We just saw it, it like just dropped. I didn't even know if I was gonna watch it. Honestly, the first thing I saw when I saw that with the name, mm -hmm. I was like, is this like some sort of like Harry Potter fantasy thing maybe for kids or? Well, maybe we also weren't the target <laughs> audience. That's also what I wonder sometimes is, you know, maybe those ads were just going out to something that I wasn't watching or I'm aware of. And you know, I'm not, I'm not like a frequent Amazon user mm -hmm. either. So maybe I'm not seeing the banners as, as much as some might, but Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is fantastic. Yeah, but and then we all ended up- ASAP. We, but we all ended up loving it. Yeah, it's great. None of us had heard about it. We weren't talking about it. Before. You know, a streaming show that has really great marketing is Handmaid's Tale. Yes. Handmaid's Tale really went above and beyond with actually catching some attention with that. And speaking of which, that is another show that you should watch ASAP if you're not already. I just watched the most recent episode and, oh, that show is just, it is so stressful. I think it's the show that has, you know, every single time it cuts to a commercial break and you're like, no, yeah. or the episode ends. I think it's getting the biggest reaction out of me in that sense mm -hmm. than any other show I've watched probably in the last like couple of years. Okay. It's intense. It's intense and I can't handle it, but I am going to handle it because I love it. And it's good TV. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag. Dennis, thank you for being here. While you're also in Vegas, hopefully we're seeing some of you in Vegas too right now. Please like and share this episode and also tune in tomorrow for a brand new episode with not just me, but it's gonna be me and John Roca right here on Mailbag tomorrow morning, Sunday, 9 a.m. PT. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You wanna watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.